Hello. Welcome to our continued look at the Word of God, and today we're in 2 Chronicles, and we're now moving into the more of the life and the end of the reign of Solomon. Again, Chronicles is a positive book. They're saying mostly good things. It's focused on the nation of Judah, and only when absolutely necessary, you could say, does the author of Chronicles you know, shine a light on the mistakes and the sins of the kings of Judah and the people of Judah. But we'll look at some of that today. In 2 Chronicles chapter 8, it says that, verse 1, um, at the end of the 20 years in which Solomon had built the house of the Lord and his own house, Solomon, that's half of his reign. He reigned for 40 years, the first 20 years, thereabouts. It took him three years to start to build the temple. But 20 years he used to build the temple. He built his own house, and he did not just inherit the house of David. He built his own house, and we're going to look at why uh, right now. In verse 11, favor of Solomon was quite the womanizer, actually. He had all these wives. He had all these concubines. Uh, he was, wow. And some of his wives were foreign wives. And the Bible specifically says, do not marry outside of Judaism. In fact, in the days of Moses, and I would say even in the days of Joshua, people did not marry outside their own tribe. Someone from Judah did not marry a, a woman from Ephraim. <laughs> they stayed within their own tribe. But then the tribes kind of merged into one another. It kind of became muddy and the, the all of Israel, especially under David, they no longer had their little territories as you know, divided by tribe, it was now one big country under a king, under Saul, then under David, under Solomon, they were one big country. But Solomon, probably to make a political alliances, uh, he married the daughter of Pharaoh. And he had so many different wives, I'm sure, that uh, many of them were not Jewish, and many of them brought their own pagan idols to Jerusalem when they came to be the wife of Solomon. And so Solomon's wife did not live in the house of David. He built her her own house. The places were holy where the ark of the Lord entered. David's house was holy. And Solomon, even though he was not living, this is my feeling, he really was not living in righteousness. He was still playing with idols of other gods, but he was aware of of David's devotion to the Lord, and he wasn't going to desecrate anything in David's house. He had that much respect for David, and probably that much fear of the Lord, actually, when you get right down to it. So, um, Solomon becomes wealthy. Of course, he's, uh, we're going to see in just a few minutes, how the kingdom that David had went all the way to the Euphrates. We know that, that Israel at that time was a superpower just like the United States, Soviet Union in the days of the Cold War, perhaps China today would be considered a superpower. Israel was a superpower in the world at that time. And because of that, Sheba, the Queen of Sheba, comes up to visit Solomon. It was kind of like a, a summit conference. And she wants to meet the King of Israel, the, the man, the most powerful man in the world, perhaps. She's heard of his wealth. She's heard of his wisdom, all these good things, and she wants to meet him. And he really made an impression on her. She, br she brings him gifts and, and uh, money and everything else. And then she says this in 2 Chronicles 9, 8. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on his throne as king for the Lord your God, because your, love, your God loved Israel and establish them forever. Now, boy, that'll give Solomon the big hit. God has delighted in you, and he put you on the throne. Oh, wow, boy, it really makes you feel like, well, boy, I'm a really important person. And then he said, he made you, Sheba said, she said, he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. Here it is again. We saw the same quote in Kings. Solomon has been given a task by the Lord to do justice and righteousness. If someone is in leadership, that's their mission. A government leader, a pastor of a church, the leader of a family, the leader of a company, 
leader of a community. If you're a leader, your mission is to do justice and righteousness, not to use your position for personal gain. But that's what happened here. Now, again, we're going to look down at verse 22. And this is where it says, King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. Israel is a superpower. And all the kings of the earth were seeking the presence of Solomon to bear his wisdom, which God put in his heart. This is chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. Solomon was given peace, prosperity. He was given all the blessings he could have from his father's hard work and what David earned. He then gave to Solomon as an inheritance. And Solomon, in a lot of ways, blew it. And that's kind of sad. It's uh, my generation. Uh, I know my father's generation suffered through the Depression in the United States, suffered through World War II, won a great victory, and then gave us, my generation, peace and prosperity. And as a result, even, even back in the 40s and 50s, the church was strong. A lot of people went to church. We can debate the merits of discipleship and the devotion of people to the Lord, but the church was strong, and to say good things about the church and good things about the Lord was the politically correct thing to do. But this generation, given the peace and prosperity, forsook the Lord for pleasure, and now the world's in a kind of mess today because of that. Anyway, uh, uh, where are we here? Um, like I said, all kings around the world were seeking Solomon. But Solomon obviously developed into a harsh king. In chapter 10, Solomon dies, uh, chapter 9 and verse 31. But then in chapter 10, Rehoboam is his son, and he's ready to become king. And people went and confronted Rehoboam. And this is what they said. Your father, Solomon, your father made our yoke hard. Therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. Solomon did not leave Rehoboam a very nice kingdom. A lot of the people that were subjects of Solomon's reign were not happy. He was a harsh king. And he's at, they're gone to Rehoboam and said, lighten the load a little bit. You know, take it easy. Don't make so many demands on your people. And of course, we know what happened. He went to his advisors, and some of them said, you know, if you do what your people say and you serve the people, they'll serve you and follow you, and you'll be a great man. There were others that said, no, no, we don't want to let, get pushed around by the people. You tell them we're going to, you know, we're going to make it even tougher on them. We're going to show them who's boss. And the people rebelled. And there was a division between the nation of Judah and the nation of Israel. And we read in the scripture that this is from the Lord. In chapter 11 and verse 4, um, the Lord says to Rehoboam, do not go up or fight against your relatives. Return all your soldiers to his house, for this thing is from me. It was God's plan to bring... <laughs> I dropped my notes. Uh, it was God's plan to bring division to his people, two different nations. And so, but in the process, Jeroboam becomes king of the northern... Uh, territory. It becomes a new kingdom. It's now the nation of Israel. Rehoboam is king of the nation of Judah. And Rehoboam starts doing some politically stuff, political stuff that turns his people against the Lord. That's what it's designed for. First of all, the priests and the Levites who were in all Israel stood with Rehoboam in Judah. The Levites left their pasture lands and their property came to Judah and Jerusalem. So all the Levites, spiritually minded people, we want to serve the Lord. We want to recognize the temple as the place where the Lord lives. And we want to do service to the Lord in the temple. And Jeroboam, politically now, 
realizes if all the people of the nation of Israel go down to, to Jerusalem three times a year for special worship times, they have a connection with the nation of Judah. And eventually that connection will cause a, a reunification of the nation of Israel. Jeroboam can't have that. We're separate. We want to have nothing to do with Jerusalem. So he sets up pagan idols in Bethel and up in Dan and tells the people, you don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. Here's God's. Just go to your local God. And I imagine there was a lot of pressure, social pressure, political pressure, government pressure for people not to leave Israel and go back to Jerusalem into Judah, but to worship God here. And that became the sin of Jeroboam, which lasted for the entire history of the nation of Israel. And we know that when Israel finally falls, the Lord tells the people, this is why, because you didn't, you didn't continue the service of the Lord at the temple like I told you to do. And that's the sin of Jeroboam. It's uh, chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. It says, let's see, the Levites left their pasture lands and their property came to Judah. Rehoboam and his sons had excluded them from serving as priests to the Lord. Rehoboam went to the actual tribe of Levi and says, you guys aren't going to be priests anymore. Get out of here. You're not going to do it. He set up priests of his own for the high places which he had made. And those from all the tribes of Israel who set their hearts on seeking the Lord followed them to Jerusalem. So there were uh, practicing Jews that are in the house, uh, practicing Jews in the nation of Israel who said, no, this isn't right. We're moving to Jerusalem and we're going to continue to serve the Lord. And they did so in the kingdom of Judah. And Father, help us regardless of what it means. If, if, the, if our situation exists that the place where we worship has been taken away by people who don't put you first and who are instituting false gods and idols and false doctrines, give us the courage to leave and find people the true people of God to worship with them. There's a lot going on. A lot of churches today are trying to be politically correct instead of Bible correct. So help us stand with those who stand with you. Unite to shine your light, your love, your holiness to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.